of our hearts be acceptable to thee, O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. In the very middle of this long reading, we hear the words, Jesus took the bread and he gave thanks and he distributed the bread to everyone who was seated. These words may sound familiar to you, but they would have sounded more familiar to the early Christian communities who immediately after Jesus' resurrection began meeting together to share a meal. And it was at these meals that they frequently experienced Jesus coming to them in his risen form. After the Pentecost, it was during meals that they experienced the power of the community being one community during this Eucharistic meal where they said that word, give thanks, or Jesus gave thanks. The Greek word for give thanks is Eucharist. So that word is put in there by John who wrote this story in his gospel. But he didn't make up this story. The story was in all four of the Gospels. It became a very core part of the early Christian worship. And we know that they were using it in Eucharist because of this word that's in the middle of the reading. This was the first time Jesus fed a group of people that was larger than his immediate 12. We know that he took bread and he gave thanks and he distributed the bread at the Last Supper. That was at Passover. And again, this reading draws our attention to this was near Passover also. When they sat on the grass and this big crowd came in, it was near Passover time. So we have several reminders of the Last Supper when Jesus also said, Eucharist, thank you, God, and then broke the bread. What follows after this week, we have three more weeks of bread readings. So buckle your seatbelt. <laughs> this is the only one that is in all four of the Gospels. And so it gets a special attention today, especially because we have a new member of Christ's community, Abigail Grace, who will be made part of Christ's one holy Catholic and apostolic faith. So envision yourself for a moment as the story was written to be Jesus' disciples. You are tired down to the very bones of your being. They are going to a deserted place in order to get some time of refreshment for themselves. And what should they see when they get up on top of this mountain or they're up on the hillside? They look out and here's this mob of people coming. And it's not just a mob who are coming to have a picnic. They are coming with a strong desire to see Jesus do another sign. Now the word sign should tell you we're out of Mark and we're into John. John uses the word sign and no other gospel writer uses it to mean miracle. In the gospel according to John, he does several signs and they start out in the gospel by numbering them. The first one happens at Cana when he turns water into wine. The second one is when he's far away from Cana and a soldier tells him about his sick son. And Jesus is able to heal the son in Cana. So another one in Cana. And that was the second sign. The people are hungry for another sign. They come with an expectation that they will see another sign. Jesus knows what their expectation is just as he knows anything in our own hearts when we pray, and he is prepared to meet their need. That is the main point of both of these stories today, the one where he's walking on water, and this one where he feeds 5,000 people. So he tells Philip, how are we going to get enough money, or how are we going to get enough bread to feed all these people? And Philip must be thinking, are you nuts? Who says anything about feeding them? We were going on a retreat, remember? We need to be alone. Go say something to them. Teach them like you usually do. But don't feed them. You don't have money for that. And then he compares six months' wages with not even buy a little bit of food for each of them. 
But Jesus is setting him up, as he does often. And he knows what he's going to do. The presentation of five barley loaves and two fish will remind the readers of their very favorite story back in 2 Kings, which I'm sure you all know what he's referring to. We go to Episcopalians, we know our Bible. I'll tell you. The story in 2 Kings is about Elisha. And Elisha was presented with barley loaves and two ears of corn. And he was able to multiply these loaves so that all were fed. And afterwards, they took up baskets to collect the leftovers. Sound familiar? That's exactly what this story is to remind us of. That Jesus didn't just feed a hundred people, which is what Elisha did. He fed 5,000 people. And it was two fish. So, some other things to pay attention to. In the early Christian church, they were able to go back and look at these stories that people told about what Jesus did and see that there was more significance to it than they thought. It's not just that he uses the word Eucharist to remind us of our communal meal at the Eucharistic feast. It's that they were doing many other things, very similar to the Last Supper. They were sitting down. Jesus reclined at table with his friends. They sit down and have a meal together. This is a formal meal. And the fact that he is saying a thanksgiving over it reminds them of the blessing that they would say in their Jewish tradition. But it's not a blessing, it's thanksgiving. After the resurrection, these prayers of thanksgiving were coming so spontaneously and this joy was so contagious that that was the central theme of the new Christian Jesus movement. Thanksgiving, praise, adoration, and worship. All of that is present in this reading if you look between the lines. Now, the people recognized that this was a sign. The disciples didn't get it. But the people who were so hungry for a sign, they knew what they wanted. They received a sign. And that's how the story comes to us in all four of the Gospels. But the disciples wanted their rest, right? They had one focus. They weren't satisfied, and they didn't really understand the sign. From this point on in the gospel until the crucifixion, our disciples get a little lost. They're a little clueless. And it starts with the boat. They go out in the boat without Jesus because he's gone back up the mountain to pray, and it gets dark, and the darkness covered the earth. And here we're being reminded of the creation story, which is why we sang that hymn this morning. Because in a baptism, we're reminded of a new creation. So this is what's going to tie in with the baptism. In the darkness, the wind came up, just like at creation. And the wind stirred the waters. And the Holy Spirit hovered over the waters. Jesus is hovering over the water and blessing it as he walks on top of the water in the midst of darkness, he brings the light of Christ into the darkness. The water was sure death to these poor disciples who were not expecting a miracle and were feeling hopeless and afraid. There were many deaths in the Sea of Galilee, and they thought theirs was coming any minute. When they see Jesus, rather than recognizing that they are okay and that they can expect a miracle to happen when they hang out with they're more terrified. They're more scared than ever, which is kind of pointing us to what happens at the crucifixion. They get so terrified, they run away. But they have nowhere to run. They're in the boat. They think they've seen a ghost. We don't know what they think, but they were terrified. And Jesus says the words that Moses heard from the burning bush. He says, I am. The translation in this context is, it's me, guys. And they would hear his familiar voice and know it was Jesus. And then he says, don't be afraid, it is me. But we know when John puts those words, it is I, I am, that we are to think of that burning bush and Moses hearing the voice of God, self-identifying himself, which is what Jesus does. I am. And then he says, I am the bread of life. I am the resurrection of the life and the life. I am the blood, I am the bread, 
you know, the rest of the I am's in John. But this coming together of their fear and his miracle reminds us that every Eucharistic meal after the resurrection, his disciples have to remember how scared they were. They have to remember with shame that they didn't believe. And the thanksgiving goes even deeper when you feel that you have been forgiven for your unbelief. They have all been forgiven. And so the deepness of this gratitude and faith is what permeates the meal that we share together. When we bring this new child into the body of Christ, we give thanks that she is part of this body of Christ that goes communally to the altar to share this meal. And communally we go back out and go our different ways, but we know that we're connected. We never stop being connected by that love that binds us together and by the joy that all of our desires will be met. Jesus will walk on the water near us whenever we need him. We may not get what we want. We usually don't get what we want. But we will get what we need in the time that it takes for Jesus to teach us what we need to learn. So let us give thanks and rejoice. And I'd like to end with a prayer that comes right out of the second reading from Ephesians. In the order of St. Helena, we would say this prayer on a weekly basis. Glory to God, whose power working in us can do infinitely more than we can ask or imagine. Glory to God from generation to generation, in the church and in Christ Jesus, forever and ever. Amen. Amen.